morning, church family. Welcome to our morning service at First Real Baptist Church. My great pleasure to welcome you this morning, and I'm looking forward to worshiping alongside you. Friends, what a great privilege we have to worship God. Think of all the thousands, all the hundreds of things you could be doing right now. But instead you're here and you get to worship God. Not a God that you have made up. Not a God that somebody else has made up. But the God who has revealed himself in his word. Moses says in Deuteronomy rather, chapter 5, verse 26 says this. Who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire, and we have and will live. Friends, what a great privilege we have this morning to hear from God and to worship God. Let's start our service together in prayer so that we might not miss this opportunity and that we certainly would not take it for granted. Let's pray together. Father God, we're so thankful for the routine. We're so thankful for... Um, the church on the same time, the same day, the same place, every week. But Father, there's danger of routine. <laughs> Father, we don't want to come today as a matter of routine. We don't want to come today and miss you. We don't want to come today uh, for any other reason than to worship you. Father, forgive us when we come to worship lightly. Forgive us when we come to worship distractedly. Forgive us when we open our Bibles and we don't expect anything weighty or great or glorious to happen. Father, forgive us that we take the most important, the most significant things in the world right now. Father, we come this morning not as perfect, oh, but as forgiven. Forgiven and welcomed by the blood of Christ, your Son. Worshipping because He is alive hoping because he has promised never to leave us. Lord, we pray that this morning we would worship you in spirit and truth and we would receive your word as it really is, the word of God, not the ideas of men. Father, for that to happen, we pray you send your Holy Spirit that we might meet with you. That we wouldn't just be gathering out of routine, but that we would be gathered to worship. Father, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, John Boston's going to come and read If you would please stand as we sing. If y'all stand, we'll start singing. <laughs> To Canaan's land I on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no
you may be seated. What a day that will be indeed. Thank you, Brother John. Let me uh, thank those of you who have uh, left myself or Brother George Mullen with a recommendation for Deacon. For those of you uh, who have not yet done that, uh, please do uh, take the time to pray over that recommendation and then uh, let myself or Brother George know what your recommendation is. Uh, obviously, uh, the nomination and, and then ordination of a new Deacon is not a uh, popularity contest. Uh, or a skills assessment, um, but man, here we're going to be led by the Word of God. So if you're not familiar uh, with what the Scriptures say about the sort of character requirements to serve in the office of deacon, let me encourage you to spend some time reading, uh, particularly First Timothy chapter three. Uh, we spent some time in those verses a couple of weeks ago uh, to seek the Lord's face in prayer as you make those recommendations. Thank you for those who have been so faithful uh, in offering and uh, giving. Through this strange season, let me continue to encourage you to do that. We can't outgive God, amen. amen. He's given abundantly to us. Obviously, we're not taking our offering in the normal way and probably won't be for the foreseeable future. So please do leave your tithe and offering in the offering box as you leave the church on your right hand side. Let me encourage you to pray for Margaret Poston and her family. Margaret's sister Sue went to be with the Lord yesterday afternoon. Um, quite some so do keep her in the prayers. Also, we're praying for Kathy Brown. This is Miss Pat, Miss Pat Brown's sister, uh, who is uh, undergoing some treatment at the moment. So do keep her in the prayers. Continue to pray for Natalia Lichty. Uh, Natalia has come through the uh, treatment for her cancer. Um, but now she's recovering from that treatment, if you understand. The treatment itself seems to have been successful, so now we're just asking the Lord to give her the strength and the energy to recover from that treatment. Also, I do pray for Miss Pat Davis. Uh, Miss Pat's had a loading reaction uh, to a shot she had at the end of the week, and so just pray that the Lord uh, would heal her. Also praying for Brother Mike Decker. Uh, Brother Mike was cutting his grass last week, uh, was bitten by a snake. Uh, so I uh, do pray for him. It's not as bad as it could have been. Um, we're certainly thankful for that. We pray uh, for ongoing and speedy recovery from that. Let's pray together. Father, you are a good God, and we are thankful that because of what Jesus has done, we can uh, come to you in prayer. We can lift up our physical and our spiritual concerns. Father, we pray for those who we've mentioned who are sick, that you touch them, heal them. Father, for those who are sick through circumstance, for those who uh, are struggling with more um, chronic sicknesses, Lord, we pray that your hand of blessing and strength and health and hope will be on them. Uh, Lord, we know that there are many who would love to be here this morning, but uh, not currently able. So we pray that even though the aid will be with us, uh, Lord, we ask that they would know that you are with them. Father, we're so thankful that we can give, and I pray that. As we spend what's been given, everything will be spent in your glory. Lord, that on hungry road, men and women, men and women would know that there's a God who's alive, a God who loves them. Father, guide us in this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're able, well, please stand once again.
up here because I know it's hard for y'all to sing with those masks on. It's hard to talk, much less sing. And I want you to listen to the words of this verse. I think this is one of the favorite verses of this song for me. Listen as I sing this, this verse. My sin, oh, the bliss of this
in so many things and ways. And I'd also point out that he don't say very much, I hope he did. And he does everything for me. He will call me, let me do anything, but yeah. he does all he can to keep up with everything, the house, the food, and everything. And he, he really deserves praise for that because that's a lot. Anybody else before we get to the scriptures today? Yes, what? I just praise God and I thank Him every day that we are healthy, our family is healthy. Karen works in the medical office. And they, they have to screen everybody in the office who have come in positive. And we pray for her all the time. James helped us compromise yeah. <laughs> from, from the virus. As long as we're free of the virus, we feel like we're truly blessed. And I'm still upright. <laughs> 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 I have to be around. 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 God is good. It's good to celebrate His goodness together. Well, come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to continue our study uh, in this great book. Uh, this letter from Paul to his young protege, Pastor Timothy, there in the city of Ephesus. Um, in the, the mid first century in the 60s uh, AD, about 30 years after Christ um, came. So, what a great insight we have into the life uh, of the first century here through this letter. First Timothy chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 6, and we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter in verse 16. First Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. <coughs> If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing this, thou shalt both save thyself, and them that hear thee. Father, every Sunday I stand here and completely aware that uh, my words can in no way do justice or approach your word. Every Sunday, Father God, knowing that I need your help, that we need your help. But every Sunday, knowing that your help has been promised, your help has been provided, your help has been guaranteed. Lord, I'm so thankful that time and again in the scriptures, the testimony is that you are with your church, that you are among your church, that you are the shepherd of the sheep, that you are the pastor of the church. Father, for the 30, 40 people here this morning, I know that there are 30 or 40 different needs, 30 or 40 different issues, 30 or 40 different questions, and Lord, only you can answer all those needs and issues and questions. I pray that you would. Father, this is an extraordinary passage of Scripture. Help us then to learn and to love as we look at it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, this morning we're faced with the greatest point of unity in the human experience and the greatest point of division in the human experience. In this verse before us this morning, we find the greatest point of unity in the human experience, something that unites all of us, and the greatest point of division in the human experience, something that divides all of us. Let's think about the unity first. Here's what unites us this morning. We didn't come to church this morning out of religious performance. We didn't come to church this morning to get some warm, fuzzy feeling. We didn't come to church this morning to tick a box. We came to church this morning because we want to be different. We came to church this morning because we want to change. And that's good, because First Timothy can help us with that. That's the point of unity that we have in front of us this morning. Well, what's the point of division? Well, the point of division that 1 Timothy chapter 4 and the whole letter brings us to is the greatest point of division in the human experience. The point of division between the gospel, between the revealed true religion that we see in the scriptures and every man-made religion out there. That's the greatest division in the human experience. Every other religion says, do. Jesus says, I've done it all, so come and enjoy. That's why on the first Sunday of every month, how do we end our service? We end our service with a meal, with bread, with juice, because Jesus has provided everything we need. Every other religion can basically be broken down like this. Have some sort of religious experience, do more good stuff than bad stuff, and then hope for the best when you die. But in the scriptures we meet the Lord Jesus who offers rest for the weary, hope for the hopeless, and another chance for us all. I'm thankful for Jesus. Well, Paul, the great apostle, the great father of the New Testament church, wants his protege, wants this young pastor, Timothy, to never let his people forget that. It's amazing how much of the Christian life, it's amazing how much of growth in godliness depends on words like remember and continue. It's amazing if you read through uh, Paul's letters to Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then his letter to Titus, another young pastor that we find in, in that letter called Titus. It's amazing how many of Paul's instructions simply break down to remember this and keep doing that. We see it in other parts of the Bible too. 2nd Peter chapter 2, verse 3 says this, the se This second letter, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. If you want to be a faithful, growing Christian, you must remember. Jude verse 5 tells us the same thing. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this. Here's the thing about godliness. Here's the thing about Christian living. Here's the thing about church week after week after week. We are not here to learn something new. We're not here to learn something new. I'm not here to teach you something new. We're here to go deeper into the old things. The minister's job is not to entertain, but to remind. To, again in the words of 2 Peter, Two, three, to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I hope no one learns anything new this morning. But I hope at best you see old truths in new places. I love the idea of the minister as the tour guide who points out treasures that we might otherwise have missed. That's what Paul seems to be suggesting to Timothy in verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, 
thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. But as far as preachers remind you of the truth that we find in the Bible, they are good ministers, qualified pastors. That phrase, put in remembrance there in verse 6, has the suggestion of being purposeful and gentle, like a shepherd with a flock. Paul wants Timothy to know that the one aim for his church is to grow in godliness. And I hope you came this morning, like we said, not for the warm fuzzy, not to tick a box, not for a religious experience, but so that you can grow in godliness. I hope you want to change, whether you've been walking with the Lord for five minutes or 50 years. I hope there are sins in your life that you desire to put to death. Verses 7 and 8 show us the excellence of godliness. The godliness is the best option. The godliness is the best path. The godliness is the greatest thing. The excellence of godliness. Look at verses 7 and 8 with me. Paul writes, Refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For godly exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. So what is godliness? Let's, let's define our terms a little bit. If we're going to talk about godliness, if we're going to strive after godliness, if we're going to grow in godliness, what is godliness? Well, godliness can be best defined as an outward faith in God produced by inward reverence for God. Actions that please God, produced by a heart that is pleased with God. Godliness is outward and inward. It's seen and unseen. A godly life is a life that uses time and treasure and talents for God, not for self. But a godly life that is seen has to be empowered by what's unseen. Your actions for God have to be power and have to be formed by your heart for God. We have to see it, but it depends on what's unseen. If all your godliness is seen by people and there's nothing happening in your heart, you're not godly, you're a hypocrite. But we use our time and our treasure and our talents for God, our outward faith is motivated by our inward reverence. Because we worship God with our hearts, our lives demonstrate it. We see that this godliness tells a better story. Refuse profane and old wives' fables. If you're going to be godly, you must refuse something. If you're going to be godly, you must reject something. Godliness requires discernment. Christian, you cannot and you must not approve of everything that attaches the word Christian to it. There are things that you must reject. Paul describes them as profane and old wives' fables, no doubt referring to chapter, uh, to verse 3, where the teaching was that you had to abstain from marriage and certain meats if you really wanted to be spiritual. If you really wanted to be godly, those were the things you would do. But Paul says, no, you've got to reject that truth. Christian, pray that God will give you the gift of discernment so that in this day, when you can be exposed to hours and hours and hours of Christian teaching and Christian publications and Christian information on the internet, pray that God will give you the, the discernment to reject what you should reject. Just because someone's on the radio or on the TV or in the internet doesn't mean you should listen to them. Godliness tells a better story. If you're trying to save yourself through self-denial, you'll never be happy. That was the problem in Ephesus. These believers were trying to work their way to God by self-denial. But you'll never be happy with self-denial. Why? Because you can always deny yourself more. You can always be less comfortable. You can always be less indulgent. But Jesus tells us a better story. Again, we see this division, don't we? The division that says work and do, and the division that says come to Jesus and worship. Godliness tells a better story, not only than the struggles in first century Ephesus, but also than the struggles in 21st century America. The fight in 2020 isn't about a virus. 
The fight in 2020 isn't about our relationship with our slightly complicated history. The fight in 2020 isn't about an election. The fight in 2020 is about what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, what is worth giving our lives to. That is what we are fighting about. Ultimate questions of reality, ultimate questions of meaning. And we've got to believe and hold on to and proclaim the truth that godliness tells the best story. We must reject everything that doesn't fit into, into creation, catastrophe, Christ, consummation. We have to reject everything that does not fit into the story the Bible tells us. Because godliness tells us a better story. <coughs> Secondly, we see, or thirdly rather, we see that godliness offers a better reward. Godliness is excellent because it tells a better story. Godliness is excellent because it offers a better reward. Paul tells us uh, to exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For godly exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the prom promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Paul says, listen, there is some benefit in physical exercise. There's some benefit in going to the gym. There's some benefit in walking. I try and walk, some of you know I try and walk every day. During the week at least, I try and walk every day. And my walk normally takes me past, uh, past the Boster's house. And if I've timed it right, I get Josh Boster, I get Lucas, Josh is still a bed at that point I guess, I get Lucas waving to me as I walk past his house. Man, it's like being the Pope and the President. You know, I feel like I've come back from the moon or something. Sometimes that's the highlight of my whole day. And there's some benefit in physical exercise. But there's much more benefit in spiritual exercise. And godliness encourages us to get this balance right. Paul tells us, Godly exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life which is now and that which is of and that which is to come. So physical exercise can make your life now a little bit better, and that's it. Spiritual exercise can make your life now better, and your life to come better. Today, godliness can produce in you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. That's Galatians 5. 22 to 23 tells us. Godliness makes our lives better now. As we pursue Jesus, as we reject sin, as we believe in Him, then God the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and our minds with the fruit of the Spirit. Who doesn't want more love, more joy, more peace, more long suffering, more gentleness, more goodness in their lives? If you want those things, pursue godliness. Godliness also promises us that our lives will be better in the world to come. That if you're not pursuing godliness in this life, then you will not meet Jesus as your brother and friend in the next life. That if you're not training your life for heaven, then you will not be there after death. 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that wrath is stored up for who? For the ungodly. Friend, if godliness seems like a small thing to you, if godliness seems like details to you, if godliness is, is just nowhere on your radar, can I warn you by the authority of the Word of God that day by day, God's judgment is being stored up for you. If there is no fruit of the Spirit in your life, then there is only the judgment and the wrath of God waiting for you. Revelation 22.5 tells us that the ungodly are left outside heaven. If you don't enjoy godliness now, why would you enjoy godliness in heaven? Sorry. If you don't enjoy worshipping Jesus here, why would you enjoy worshipping Jesus forever in heaven? But you know how much you value God's promise by how much you value godliness. Godliness tells us a better story. Godliness offers us better rewards.
But Paul knows this is a big ask. So verses 9 and 10 show us an encouragement to godliness. Verse 9 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, especially those who is to come. Christian, there will be loss in godliness. You will have to say no to things if you're saying yes to godliness. Is it worth it? Well, listen to verse 9 again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. This is not Paul's opinion. This is not a preacher's opinion. This is not a book's opinion. This comes directly from the mouth of God into our ears that everything we lose in the pursuit of godliness will be more than rewarded as we grow in godliness. So find it sin with that power. Train your appetites with that power. We want to do the things that feel good. So let's train ourselves to believe that godliness feels better than sin. That it's better to be with Jesus, better to be close to Him than indulging all the sins that our flesh lead us towards. Christian, you are not supposed to be led around by the nose. You're supposed to have the discernment and the spiritual maturity to say no to the things that empty your heart of the Holy Spirit and yes to the things that make your heart a place where God the Holy Spirit can live. Every loss you suffer will be worth it. So at the moment of temptation, take up this promise and fight with it. Fight against the desires of your flesh as you come to face that temptation. Paul even tells us to do this, doesn't he? He tells us then, uh, in verse 10, to labour and suffer reproach. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, for therefore, right, there's the link word, right? We can trust in God's word, so let's live for God. We value God's promises. Oh, we value God's promises to give us life forever, eternal joy with Jesus. We value those promises, so let's trust in God and let's live for God in this life. Let us labour and suffer reproach. Yes, the Christian life involves labour. The Christian life is not a ticket to heaven. The Christian life is not a float ride down a lazy river. It involves labour. But, but here's the thing. First John tells us that the Lord's commands are not burdensome because we love to labour for the Lord. It is not a burden to work for the Lord. Philippians 2.12 tells us to work out our salvation. Christian, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Serve God. Let those things you claim in your heart work their way out through your hands and feet. Christian labour. You know that bodily health takes work. So you shouldn't be surprised that spiritual health takes work. You're not going to avoid the gym and eat whatever you like and suddenly wake up one morning in the physical prime of your life. Uh, take it from one who knows. But neither are you going to skip your Bible reading and doze through church and find yourself spiritually healthy at the end of it. It's just not going to happen. Because God's promises are true and valuable and trustworthy, we labour. And Paul is really honest about what this labour looks like, isn't he? As we labour, we must we must expect rather reproach. As we labour, we must expect reproach. Christian, we can't live in a world we killed our master and expect to be treated well by him. We can't live in a world we killed the Lord Jesus and expect us, his servants, to be treated well in it. And God is showing us more and more of what the reproach that godliness produces is. We're seeing Christian bakers and, and Christian florists put out of business because they refuse to celebrate a homosexual marriage. We're seeing Bibles burn on the streets of American cities. We're seeing churches in California subject to the most extraordinary fines simply for the crime of 
gathering to worship. As we labour, we suffer reproach. Here's the Christian life in three steps. The Christian life in three steps is by grace, through fire, to glory. Christian, you and I are going by God's grace, through the fire of the world, to glory right. forever. That's right. God's promise is sure. The price is suffering, but the prize is satisfying. So we can labour and suffer because we know in the end we will be satisfied. We know that God is forming us into the people that he wants us to be. And we can do this, verse 10 continues, because we trust in the living God. <laughs> How about that? Oh, God's alive. That's the difference, right? We worship God. We worship a God who is alive. He's not a statue. He's not a painting. He's not a rock. He's not an idea. He's not a dead historical individual. We worship the living God. Christian, never take this for granted. And if you feel like your appreciation of this treasure is slipping out of your heart, then get on your knees and pray that God would give you the faith to once again be amazed that you, sinner, you worship the living God. This is as good as it gets. And only Christians get this. Because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially those who believe. God is the saviour of all men. His grace is efficient for those who put their trust in him. As we repent of our sins, God's grace covers us. He's the saviour of all men, especially of those who believe. His grace is sufficient for all who will come to him. We worship a God who is at work in the world. We look around us sometimes and we think, now, what is the world coming to? And then we read the Bible and we think, that's what the world's coming to. Jesus is going to come back. And it's all going to be alright. I read Revelation over the last couple of days. You know what the end of Revelation tells us? Man, things end really well for Jesus and really well for his people. So let's hold on to Jesus. In your personal life, hold on to Jesus. As you suffer physically or emotionally, hold on to Jesus. Because it will be worth it. Fix your eyes on God and let the suffering of the world wean you off the world. Imagine if you never suffered. Or if you lived in a world without suffering. Would you ever pray? Would you ever cry out for salvation? If we lived in a perfect world with no suffering, we think we'd already arrived. But God exposes us to suffering, to teach us that we are not there yet. God exposes us to suffering in the world to teach us that this world is not our home. You were designed for a perfect pain-free body and every pain and every ache in your body is supposed to remind you that this body and this world is not forever. So hold on to Jesus. We need to read the second half of Philippians 2.12, don't we? Some of you will have spotted that earlier I just read the first half of Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it is God who works. You are not by yourself tomorrow morning. As you battle tomorrow, whether or not to open your Bible, whether or not to say your prayers, whether or not to share your faith, whether or not to try and make a bold step for the Lord Jesus in your family, Christian, you are not alone. As you fight against sin this afternoon, with your knuckles white and your teeth bare, Christian, you are not alone. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because it is God who works. We see this in Ezekiel, don't we? The book of Ezekiel starts and ends with this great big vision of God, right? Ezekiel's by the canal, in exile, he's praying, and he looks up and he sees God. And at the end of the book we get this great long vision of the temple. So Ezekiel starts by telling the, these depressed, discouraged, disenfranchised exiles that God is with them. And Ezekiel ends by telling them that one day they'll be with God too. Christian, God is with you. 
That's his name. That's what Emmanuel means. And one day you will be with him too. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. John writes to the, the church in Philadelphia. Uh, and John writing the word of the Lord says that that church has little power but has kept the word of faith and has not denied the Lord's name. So our significance as a church is not found in power, but in faithfulness. Christian, your worth as an individual is not found in power, not found in influence, but in faithfulness. So be encouraged as you pursue godliness. Finally, Paul closes this argument with an example of godliness in verses 11 through 16. Paul writes to Timothy now, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to you. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, when doing this thou shalt both save thyself, and them that hear thee. Verse 16 is the absolute heart of this encouragement. Isn't it? What does verse 16 mean? It means that as Timothy's teaching stays true, and as his life matches his teaching, he will give evidence of his salvation and show others the way to that salvation. Watch your life, watch your doctrine, Timothy, for in doing that, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The old Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McChain, says, the one thing a local church needs more than anything is their pastor's personal godliness. Ian Bounds says that the church looks for new methods but God looks for new men. Yes. Timothy's life and doctrine are to be watched so that he might save himself and show the way of salvation to those who hear him. Timothy, watch your life. Verse 12 tells him, tells him to be an example. Don't let people look down on you because you are young, but instead be an example to them of what a biblical Christian looks like. Timothy, watch your life. Verse 14 tells Timothy not to be negligent. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, but work and labour so that that gift grows. Timothy, watch your life. Verse 15 tells him to live in such a way that his profiting may appear to all. This is surely verse 8 in action. As Timothy exercises himself in godliness and everybody around him can see it. Timothy, watch your life. But Timothy, watch your doctrine. Verse 11, these things command and teach. Timothy's priority, the minister, the pastor's priority, has got to be this time, right here, teaching God's people in God's house from God's word. The pastor can neglect almost anything else as long as he's ready to teach on Sunday. I'll be honest with you, not all my sermons are always ready to go. But it's always time. It's not like I don't always finish sermon prep. It's, it's just Sunday at 11 o'clock. And it's time to command and teach. But that is the priority. Timothy, watch your doctrine. Persist in this. Verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Read the word. Teach the word. Encourage those believers in the word. Paul says, till I come, don't quit. I love verse 15. Watch your doctrine. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy property may appear to all. Meditate is like a cow chewing the cud. Keep turning these things over in your mind. Give thyself wholly to them. Timothy, beware that the ministry doesn't turn into a 40 hour week job and you fill the rest of the time with hobbies. One commentator. Says here that says that the idea here is that Timothy should be addicted to the scriptures as he provides a godly example to his church. That is the scriptures that shape us, the scriptures that form us, the scriptures that give us our appetite, 
the scriptures that kill our appetites for sin. This is an example of godliness, and a, and a church's pastor should be that example of godliness, Paul tells Timothy. A pastor's responsibility is to make visible progress in godliness, preaching, and other areas of his gift. Timothy was to grow into his ministry as a humble, teachable man of God and provide an excellent example to his church as he does so. Friends, godliness is out of fashion today. Godliness is out of fashion today. And when I say that, I mean godliness is out of fashion in the church. When we look for a new church, how often do we think, well, what's the music like? What programs do you run? How rarely do we think, what's being taught from the poor? Is this church going to help me to live godly? Can I tell you the best kids program a church can run is faithfully teaching Mark <coughs> the gospel week after year. Godliness is out of fashion today in the church at large. Maybe godliness is out of fashion in your life. Maybe there are some habits you need to reconsider. Maybe some, there are some activities you need to change. Maybe there are some things that you need to do differently because you know that that habit, that activity, that thing, whatever it is, is slowly but surely chipping away at your godliness. You fill up your bucket each Sunday, but your bucket has holes in them because the direction of your life is not towards the Lord Jesus. Maybe godliness is out of fashion in your family. Maybe you're the only one who fell up your stand alone. Christian, can I tell you that one man with God is always the majority. Continue to pursue godliness for your own sake and the sake of those around you. Friends, godliness is out of fashion today, but it is our calling. In Christ, we find all we need. So let's go to him and keep going ahead to find strength for each moment, to find strength for each moment, and hope for each tomorrow. Let's go to Christ now. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we're so thankful for your word. Thankful that you speak, and that you speak in a way that we can understand and comprehend and apply. And Father God, I pray that you have spoken this morning. You, Father, not me. Father, I pray that what has been true will be lodged in our hearts. What has not been true or helpful will be forgotten. Father, lead us in godliness now and as we live. It's easy here. It's easy in the pew. It's easy in church. But help us to know that godliness is excellent. Help us to know that your promises encourage us to godliness. And help us to follow the example of godliness, not just that we see in Scripture, but that we see in our lives. And now, church, just for a few moments as Miss Diane plays, you have the opportunity to respond. Maybe you know there's something that you do that stops your growth in godliness. Would you commit to the Lord now that you will work that habit out of your life? Maybe it's not so much an activity or a habit, maybe it's just the general state of your heart is not interested in growing in godliness. Friend, the Lord Jesus is here for you and he invites you to repent. As you repent, he will give you all the strength and all the power in you. Maybe you know that this week at work or, or when you go home or, or you know there's a particular situation that you will need God's help in. Would you ask him for that help? Man, he loves to help you. That he loves to be asked. As Diane plays for a few moments, do business with God this morning. Spirit, hovered over the waters in Genesis 4, and so your Holy Spirit will hover over our hearts this morning. God, as your word created new life, new creation in Genesis 1, so your word will give us new life this morning. 
I will apply the UDR to this. I will apply the shape of my eyes into God. I will apply these things to Jesus. John, do you have a song for us? Okay. Church family, thank you so much for being here this morning. It's been good to see you. I hope you've been helped and challenged and encouraged. If we can serve you in any way this week, please don't hesitate to let us know. I'm going to ask you, actually I'm not going to ask you this time. I still can't be used to dismissing you. That's okay. I'm going to ask Brother Ron Carter. Brother Ron, if you would pray to dismiss us, and then I'll come and dismiss you. Let me encourage you to fellowship, but let me encourage you to do it uh, not in the building. Thank you. Brother, let's pray. Father, it's been good to be in your house today with your people to hear your word. We came hungry and you fed us on the bread of life, and we came thirsty and you've given us living water. <coughs> May we so live that we'd be pleasing to you, that others would see you in us and want what we have. Go with us now, God, we pray. Lead us in the paths of righteousness that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.